Ple pleasure to be here, and I wish I had the bounce that Dr. Holsapple had and jogging up to the podium, but probably not good for a motivational speaker. I do appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and visit with you today. I like, like Dr. Holsapple have been at this a very long time. I may have spent more of my life at this than he has, but he just hasn't been around long enough. He's got another 20 years to go, I think. We've been interested in replacing petroleum with renewable fuel since the first oil crisis here and the oil, and the oil limitations in the lines uh, that we all experienced for gasoline. And we felt then and still feel that the most appropriate places to start are to use agricultural residues, wood waste, energy crops and trees, and of course, municipal solid waste right in there. Things that have been had other purposes that are um, undervalued components that we'd like to upgrade. Once these problems are tackled and solved, then to move on to energy farms and energy plantations of various sorts is needed. Now in 2005 and 2007, the government passed uh, renewable fuel standards indicating that they planned an expansion of cellulosic fuel to supplement that fuel, the 15 billion gallons a year already produced from corn. This is the first year when that comes into effect and we're running a little behind, but we've heard many talks and the mention of many companies that are beginning to start producing cellulosic ethanol this year. I fear it will be somewhat lower than the billion gallons that uh, had been anticipated by this legislation, but hopefully it can be rapidly expanded. And of course, there are many reasons to do this. Uh, national security, having control of our energy sources, and also reduction in greenhouse gas effects. And as you can see there, uh, when, when we burn oil, 100% of the carbon is going into the atmosphere, CO2. Um, as we have um, cellulosic ethanol or um, can't, uh, let's see, I, sh I should be looking at another slide or get some more glasses, one or the other. Um, <laughs> the uh, corn and cellulosic ethanol are, um, both show reduction in cellulosic ethanol up to 90% reduction. Now woody biomass is really 60 to 70% carbohydrate as, as Dr. Holsapple had mentioned. Then Corn, wheat, and milo are about 70% starch. They're the higher percentage of carbohydrate, but starch is really the only part of those that is used in fermentations. And of course, there are sugar sources that can be directly fermented, sugar cane juice, energy beets, sweet sorghum, et cetera, that will offer opportunities. Um, much of the work and much of the cost in producing fuels or chemicals from lignocellulose are really uh, go into the deconstruction of that material. Plants have designed lignocellulose as a structural polymer um, to withstand time and to support the plant, whereas the starch is an energy reserve for a plant, rapidly mobilized during the germination of seeds. And of course, the juice of cane and beet and so forth is free sugars and can be directly fermented. Now, we can think of lignocellulose as being crystalline cellulose fibers wrapped in a matrix of hemicellulose with a thermoplastic glue, almost like an epoxy, not so different from a, a carbon fiber fishing rod or golf club. We draw cartoons to illustrate those things, only to point out that a dilute acid hydrolysis will hydrolyze many of the bonds in hemicellulose and release primarily C5 sugars. Um, this opens up the structure and converts the biomass to something that really is much like a paper towel in terms of water absorption. And we would uh, typically add enzymes to break down the cellulose into, uh, into smaller units, disaccharides and monosaccharides, and then these are actually fermented. So this is a combination of C5 and C6 sugars that are produced, and they're produced in, in Dr. Holsapple's model as well, and they're fermented by either a mixture of organisms or in our case, by a single organism. I guess we put all of our eggs into one basket, sorry. Um, those hexose and pentose sugars uh, uh, has been, uh, have been a problem. There was no organism in nature that produced a single product from those. They produced mixtures of products that weren't very valuable. And a great deal of money has been spent in engineering Saccharomyces and other yeasts to try to produce ethanol from mixtures of C5 and C6 sugars. These are yeasts that the Saccharomyces, we had to add genes for C5 utilization, or the pentose yeast that really had problems with redox balance. And these have been improved 
uh, considerably during the years, but we started this process by taking a different approach, by taking, starting with an organism which already had the capacity to use all of the sugars that are present in a plant, whether it's C5 or C6 or even uronic acids, and to convert those into pyruvate primarily, and then to convert that pyruvic acid into ethanol. And to do that, we added the ethanol pathway from organisms that make tequila. Zymomonas mobilis, a bacteria that together with yeast make ferment agave to make tequila. And we also deleted the genes for competing fermentation products, like lactic acid that you and I make. E. coli also made lactic acid as a dominant product. Now, the resulting organisms, we'll call, say a, a University of Florida cellulosic tequila-based process, was licensed by a whole series of companies at this point. Um, as Dr. Holsapple mentioned, we've experienced companies coming and going and technologies being bought and sold, and now BP owns our technology. So, um, but by deleting all of the other pathways and providing abundant enzymes to produce ethanol, we're able to achieve greater than 95% of theoretical yields in the fermentation step. And by doing this, we made an organism which was required to ferment and produce ethanol in order to grow. The only way it could make energy was to make a fermentation product, and the only product it could make was ethanol. So we had a very nice selection for improvements in our organism. When an organism grew more, grew to higher densities, it made ethanol faster, and that just didn't come out on this computer. This was just to show transferring from one container to the next. Um, allowed us to select for continual improvement in our organisms. And these three curves illustrate the improvements. Beginning uh, organisms could only produce about 20 grams per liter ethanol, and then we made improvements to 50, 65, and, and even up to 70 grams per liter of ethanol, or 7 percent. Still a fairly modest concentration compared to the fermentation of corn to ethanol with yeast, but it's very difficult to achieve sugar streams that will be uh, high enough to support high levels of ethanol when you start from woody material. Hard to make a 20, 30, 40 percent solution of wood. Very difficult. Um, once we'd engineered the ethanol organisms, we thought we'd take the same approach and make organisms which produced organic acids such as succinate, D-lactate, and L-lactate, all of which can be used to make plastics in addition to ethanol. The uh, succinate and lactate processes were licensed to a company called Merient up near Boston, and uh, they're in the process of building a 30 million ton per year plant near Lake Providence, Louisiana. A uh, plant should be completed this year and in operation. To the right of this, uh, to the left side of the slide, we can see the succinate pathway, and I want to point out that CO2 from the atmosphere is actually incorporated to make succinate. And so on a theoretical basis, the weight yield per pound of sugar is even higher than the weight of that sugar, 1.17 pounds of succinate per pound of sugar. In actuality, we can achieve about a one pound of succinate per pound of sugar. The lactate has no CO2 added, and the lactate, we get about 90% weight-weight conversion, 90 to 95. Now the succinate can be converted into a lot of compounds that then feed into plastic solvents, um, coatings, cleaning agents, and, and so forth. The lactate technology was also licensed first to Purac, excuse me, to Myriant, and then sub-licensed to Purac, and Purac is making poly-D uh, lactic acid and D-lactic acid for sale today, and we sure hope they'll ramp that up. The market hasn't grown nearly as fast as we would like, but polymerizing D-lactic acid and blending this with polymerized L-lactic acid increases the strength and increases the melting temperature, so it improves the properties of that plastic to uh, broaden the range of applications. Now, um, having worked on a few products, um, other companies began to work in, in recent times and, and really have developed a variety of other products that I can't even read. But e each of those other companies has, has been making uh, butanols, has been making farnesol, amorous, um, uh, fatty acids from fermentation, alkanes from fermentations. Um, uh, let's see, that's, a, that's about it. Alginol is actually using algae and the same enzymes we use to make ethanol 
to produce ethanol directly from a photosynthetic organism and to capture that ethanol, and, and really quite an interesting approach. Now, one thing this, um, all of these processes have in common is that they need an inexpensive source of sugars or carbohydrates for fermentation. And so, really, at that point, we began to focus on producing less expensive sugars. And uh, we started at the bottom with a mature corn to ethanol process. And it, you know, it looks pretty simple, and it really is, and it works very well, in which the uh, corn has cooked in steam. Enzymes are added to liquefy it, and more enzymes are added to complete the saccharification while the fermentation is going on and then distillation, and, and all of the materials that come into the corn plant go out of that plant as a useful product. The upper portion, uh, panel A, is a fairly classical dilute sulfuric acid process in which the lignocellulose is treated with phosphoric acid, usually in an exotic metal clad or a zirconium clad reactor. Then there's a solid lipid liquid separation to separate the hemicellulose sugars from the fiber. Probably some countercurrent washing facilities to recover more of the hemicellulose sugars. And then a detox process to ameliorate any side products and, and that serve as toxins that retard fermentation. And then separate fermentations of the cellulose and the hemicellulose. Well, there are just too many steps. It's too, too complicated. So we wanted to make that look more like the, the corn process, and, and we've selected really a phosphoric acid-based process because phosphoric acid is quite compatible with conventional stainless steel. It eliminates the needs for the, um, uh, it, for the exotic alloys. It also allows us to conduct a one-pot process, as we had described to today, as well as by the DuPont folks. Everything is kept together into a single vessel and fermented and then distilled. We started with a phase one unit operations or PDU laboratory that was supported by the Board of Regents at the University of Florida with reactors and fermenters and helpful students and a lot of helpful politicians and, and university folks and their support. We really have appreciated that. And with this dilute acid process, we used a hydrolyzer, some, something like a steam gun device that was actually built in Sweden and designed and, and published on by Guido Zaki at Lund University. And then we used screw presses to separate. And this screw press was an American product from Vincent Screw Press there in Tampa. Um, the process we put together started with raw bagasse, dilute acid, high temperature steam, an enzymatic liquefaction, fermentation of C5, C6 together, distillation to produce the ethanol, and then a waste treatment or, or solid liquid separations for various products in the end. No substrate fractionation, no liquid solid separation, no toxin cleanup, no purification of sugars, and no exotic metals or, or zirconium reactors. We looked at the optimal time and temperatures for the hemicellulose hydrolysis and for the cellulase action, and we came out with biomass after treatment with phosphoric at about pH 2.2 to 2.4, right out the pH of an RC cola. So if you ever wonder what you're doing to your teeth when you're about the same. The next problem was we had created paper towels, essentially, although they weren't bleached and white, but that pretreated biomass had the water holding capacity of a paper towel. More than 10 times its weight in water could be absorbed. And so when we made a slurry of 10 to 12 to 15 percent solids, it would not pour, it would not move except with a screw conveyor. Not even a progressive cavity pump could pump that stuff. We knew we were in trouble. So we began to look a little bit at the kinetics of digestion of cellulases as well as the viscosity, and we found very little le levels, uh, excuse me, very low levels of cellulase were able to reduce the viscosity of this material. And as we added more cellulase, the viscosity went down. They, the curve at the bottom, those rapid curve has five filter paper units, a relative measure of, of uh, cellulase activity. The next one above it is 0.5, and the next one above that, 0.25. So you can see quite, quite dramatic reductions of viscosity at, at the 20,000 units. That really means it would not move. That was, that was pegged. Probably should have put another break in that or put greater than 20,000. But the viscosity fell to two to 300 centipoise, thinner than chocolate milk in most cases. 
Um, we developed a model to explain what was happening because we only digested about 5% of the carbohydrate to get 95% reduction in viscosity, and we call it the Velcro and marbles model. Uh, we think that what we're doing with the low levels of enzyme and during the initial enzyme treatment is we're stripping off the microfibrils that are tangling, that are hooking things together, and we're left with marbles with smooth surfaces that bang against each other but are pumpable. Maybe a better idea was puzzle pieces that don't really have sticky edges that bounce off each other at least. But it becomes quite pumpable, and we can pump that slurry directly into a fermenter and ferment it. The, uh, we looked at the timing and the kinetics and came up with a plan for a six-hour retention time, continuous flow, liquefaction unit that, that seems to work quite well. Next, we needed to grow seed cultures. You hear about people trying to start up fermentations and not being able to expand their seed cultures, so we, we figured we'd better tackle that before we got into the big, bigger fermenters. And, and this just shows a 3.6 million-fold expansion of our seed cultures and this would be adequate for a fairly large fermentation unit. I should have mentioned that the only nutrients we have is we've got phosphoric acid in there. We've neutralized it with ammonia. We add a little magnesium sulfate and trace metals and we're ready to ferment, that's it. Everything we put in there is a part of fertilizer that should go back on the fields. Um, next we looked at some fermentations, first of uh, a bagasse, uh, 80 to 88 gallons per dry ton of bagasse. And, um, um, these uh, fermentations use both the glucose and the xylose, and the upper A and B panels are from sugarcane bagasse, the lower C and D panels are from sweet sorghum bagasse, and they behave very similarly. We really look at weight-weight conversions is the way I like to think about it. About up to 0.27, and we hope at some point 0.3, of the dry weight of the material is converted into ethanol, and ethanol is 6.6 .6 pounds per gallon. So I, I like to use those simple numbers to convert it. So I, I guess you, um, I should say you can um, you can see that the that the fermentations proceeded. The very rapid fall in the first part of the curve was furfural, a side product which was metabolized by our cells, and we worked to add enzymes to enhance that metabolism. It's one of the more prominent inhibitors. There's some other genetic mutations there. And there's a little bit of xylose left over, which is not completely gone by the end of 72 hours. And we're working on that, but not yet. Um, the Next, I have eucalyptus benthami. We also did waste wood, mixed wood waste from the fields after the pine plantations had been harvested. The material was scraped up, hauled in, and, and shipped. And we've run that through our system in small scale. And, Results really were a little bit, were quite similar. We had to increase the temperature or increase the acid or increase the time. It was a little bit tougher. And the yields were a little bit lower, but the carbohydrate content in our hands was a little bit lower also. Um, then we drew a generalized process for how, how we would see this working. The biomass would go through a pretreatment. A little bit of the liquid would be squeezed out, gentle squeeze, just to get enough sugars to grow our seed cultures. We don't want to have to buy sugars to grow our seed cultures. But then the bulk of the biomass, C5, C6, goes right into the liquefaction tank. After liquefaction, goes in into the fermenter, is pumped into the fermenter, and then it goes to the beer well. From the beer well to distillation, and only after distillation, and we've got a pervaporation system, for distillation that we, we were have been looking at. We'd have a decanter centrifuge to separate the two, and each, the liquid and the solid product, have various co-product uses. And you can see the times, maybe the total time we, we would think of is about three to four days. Um, the state provided funds to the University of Florida to construct a pilot plant and to begin scaling up this for research, for research and testing to help improve the processes. And that pilot plant was to be built in conjunction with a, a host or partner company that was uh, at, in the state of Florida. And we looked at a couple, and we were very happy to, to end up working with Buckeye Technologies in Perry, Florida, dissolving pulp plant, which makes lots of specialty cellulosic products. And they gave us a little bit of room, smaller, somewhat smaller than the green dot, to build a pilot plant. And that's a wood pile there. And, there's a truck down there, but I can barely see it. It's really pretty small. But the, uh, the wood pile typically runs a, a, perhaps a million tons or so. So they're, they're quite a large operation. Now, 
our, our thoughts in designing this plant was that we'd like it to be able to use woody waste materials and go through a, a cellulosic process, but also to have provision to add sugars from syrups from other crops that might be grown in Florida, as well as hemicellulose streams from the pulp and paper. And that's what we designed here. Now we've got pots and pans to carry out either an alcohol fermentation or a fatty acid fermentation. And we have distillation equipment to, uh, we plan distillation equipment for ethanol, but not for purification of organic acids. But if succinate were an organic acid that were made at this plant, all of the CO2 produced by ethanol could be rerouted right into succinate production. So you ought to get double credits for that, I think. At any rate, um, uh, we designed the plant. It, it's about 18,000 square feet. Laboratories on one side, a central processing area. The red scaffolding is where the pretreatment device is. And that solid red piece at the top is a pre-steamer. And from there, it falls into the hydrolyzer. The hydrolyzer was built by Metso Corporation with an office out of uh, Norcross, Georgia, very close to here. And they've done an excellent job. Um, the largest green tank is wastewater, <laughs> always. The next green tanks are uh, fermenters, or 10,000 gallon fermenters. And then the smaller green ones beside it are 1,000 and 100. The pink ones are extra room in case we wanted to add something else there. And perhaps most important is the 6,000 square feet that are empty. That's empty space for clients to come in and use the facilities and to work with us. And the door is open. We're delighted to have folks come and visit and looking forward to working with many. Um, the distillation has been the last thing added and it's still not quite there, but getting very close. This just shows the plant inside before we'd put all the insulation around the tanks. Those are the 10,000 gallon ferment fermentation tanks. And of course, we've had a, a couple of ceremonies out there, a groundbreaking and a grand opening. But the grand opening, everything wasn't installed yet. The distillation just got installed and this picture was a year old now. So it, it takes a while. And we had a few ups and downs and a lot of learning experiences, but we've got most of it up and running now. This is the, the facility. Whiting Turner helped us with the procurement and assembly. Ford Bacon and Davis in Greenville, South Carolina helped us with the plant design and uh, engineering. And then, of course, the, the state of Florida provided the funds to the university. And here are some of us. Um, the, uh, Dr. Nevis is really our chief engineer that's in charge of the plant. Dr. Geddes has moved on and left us and gone to Novozyme, but still a friend as is Novozyme through the years. Mr. Hoffman's our facilities director, and this was still incomplete, but behind us, we see the scaffolding for the, um, um, the hydrolyzer, and that is the, the mezzo unit there. Um, I'd like to end with this slide and, and invite all of you to come visit us. Uh, there were bioenergy meetings in Tifton, Georgia, maybe a month or so ago, and they brought a busload of folks down to visit. We kept them busy and enjoyed having them, and we hope each of you will come down and visit us as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for a nice presentation. I just want a quick question. Uh, what is the limitation on sugar content in the gas? Do you, do you feel like you need to desugarize it well before it goes into your process? We get the bagasse from Florida Crystal and the sugar is gone. They really get the sugar out. <laughs> there's, there's very little there. Um, so less than 2%? They're, they're getting 95% of the sugar out of the bagasse and, and any little bit that's remained is converted to acetic or something else while it's being trucked to us. So it doesn't hurt your process as far as forming any uh, toxic compounds or? No, it d does not. All right, thank you. Yes. Yeah. I have a question for you about the scraping up the pine scraps and fermenting the pine. <laughs> so you said the yields were a little bit lower when you, when you pre-treated the we pine? We didn't scrape up the pine. After the pine was gone, Buckeye actually takes the whole tree, limbs, everything. Whew, Right, right into okay. their process and chips it. So we took the 
hardwood that remained in the field. It was not chipped and, and taken to Buckeye or, or, was, or might have been taken to Buckeye for supplemental boiler fuel or something. But, okay. So the mixed hardwoods and, and the scrub that was there. Okay, so no pine. No, we haven't worked much on the pine. We'd have to modify the conditions a little bit for the pine. The hemicellulose sugars are a little bit different, and yes. I certainly should have mentioned Dr. Joy Peterson at the University of Georgia was really the person that got us started with the cellulose work at the University of Florida, and we're, <laughs> we're all very proud of her there. Thank you. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> I get to do that once in a while. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Lonnie.